give it a second here for him to join again. Just wanted to uh, say thanks again for jumping on. We're going to be uh, discussing uh, the five-year anniversary of really impactful full moment in, in crypto history. And, and for those crypto enthusiasts who remember 2016, um, when we had the hack of the DAO. And we'll be discussing that with, with our uh, CEO, Emin Gunsir, as well as we have a really special guest with us today, Matt Leasing uh, from Bloomberg Business, who also wrote uh, the book Out of the Ether, a really groundbreaking story uh, covering this event and um, talking uh, about kind of uncovering who, who the potential thief was. Um, so Matt, why don't we uh, invite you on while we still get uh, situated here, if you could give us a little bit of the background on, on your story and uh, talk a little about the book that you wrote and um, and how that kind of came with your coverage of this. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, you might be on mute sorry, if you want to. Thank wanna, you so much um, for having there me. There you go. You're good. Yeah, yeah, here I am. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, I was really looking forward to this. Um, so uh, real briefly, I um, got into this story in tw 2016. Um, I remember when it happened. Um, I wasn't really covering Ethereum at that time, but I was a reporter at Bloomberg, and I was I had started re um, reporting on crypto the year before in 2015. Um, as you guys may recall, if you were around um, Ethereum in 2016, really wasn't there, there wasn't much going on. Uh, they had had obviously the coin sale and um, the prices was you know kind of climbing. Uh, and then the DAO came along and it was like a huge deal because it was sort of like the only thing you could um, use your ether for. And um, then uh, it you know got hacked. Uh, and so uh, I'll, I'll I won't retell all that right now. But um, later that year, after all the dust had settled. Um, I had an opportunity to write uh, a magazine story about it. Um, we always do a heist issue in the Bloomberg Markets magazine, and, and I thought this was a great heist. So I wrote about it then, got to know, uh, I, I, I knew Goon, but I didn't know how intimately he was involved in all this. And um, the, the story was the most fun I'd ever had um, in my career. And I then used that to sort of um, get a book deal. And I, I, I realized that there's this huge, long, dramatic arc here for um, a book where I could kind of tell the story about the DAO and then um, in other chapters, uh, tell the story of how Ethereum was created and, and Vitalik Buterin and, and the co-founders that he gathered around him. So um, the book came out last year uh, in September. It's called Out of the Ether. Um, and uh, if you guys have a chance, if, you, if, this is, if you're into this, uh, you should check it out. Um, I I took it upon myself to try to find who the ether thief was. Um, I got a little bit close, um, but I'll save that um, for, for a little bit later as well. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, just kind of to go into that a little bit while we, while we still get set up here, uh, how long did it take you to kind of put this story together and put this book together? Um, the book, I spent uh, about nine months reporting it um, from about January to um you know, September, October. Uh, I, I went all over the world. I went to Switzerland. I went to Japan. Um, I went to uh, Cornell to visit Goon and, and others. Uh, uh, I went to Burning Man. Uh, uh, and and then so I, I had a ton of reporting by the time I was done. And I, I wrote it in um, just under about two and a half months. Because um, I pretty much, I, when I started out, I didn't know the story. And then when I was done reporting, I knew the story. And I just, it was just a matter of kind of picking and choosing the right parts of what I had in my notebooks. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I'm sure there was, there was a lot to, to get into. And um, can you give us a, like just a little bit of background on how you kind of started reporting in the, in the crypto space and, and then what led you to kind of being on this beat for this story? Sure. I, uh, I started at Bloomberg News in New York in 2004, and um, pretty soon I, I got onto what we call the market structure beat, um, which is how markets work or don't work, um, you know, regulation, um, you know, is the corporate bond market like trying to um, update itself, um, you know, derivatives markets, um, a big a big part of that was the financial crisis and the unregulated over-the-counter derivatives market. Um, I, I covered all of that through um, Dodd-Frank and then um, through the Dodd-Frank stuff going through the CFTC and becoming, you know, law. 
Um, so it, I did it. I did that for um, derivatives markets and like fixed income markets. And in about 2015, when I, I finally figured out what blockchain was, I realized that it had the potential to change all these all these markets that I was writing about. So I should get you know I should learn it and and get in front of it um, because I thought it, it had the potential. So I um, talked to my editor and he said, great. Uh, and I started covering it. Um, back then it was really like, you know, Bitcoin was the thing. Blockchain was being discussed. Um, one of the first big stories we did was about Blythe Masters, who was um, a banking star at JP Morgan. She had left and then she came back to be the CEO of um, this company, Digital Asset Holdings, which um, was one of the first kind of big enterprise blockchain firms um they they still to this day have a deal with the australian stock exchange where they're trying to get their um clearing and settlement all on on a blockchain so um that that that's where it started and um by the time 2017 rolled around with the ico craze and and bitcoin hitting an all-time record it was wild and crazy and it's it's only gotten more wild and more crazy since then yeah absolutely Great. Well, thank you for that 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 background. And um, we actually have Goon on now. So we have the uh, Avalab CEO, Emin Goon Sear, joining us. Uh, welcome. Glad glad we were able to figure out those technical difficulties. So uh, excited to have you and uh, wanted to see if you could give us a little bit of background on how you uh, kind of got involved in, in this story and this event back in 2016. Oh, looks like it just dropped off. All right. Still got some some tech difficulties on our side, but thanks for, for being with us and, and working through this with us. Um, so we'll give it a second to kind of uh, have that jump back in here with, with Goon. But um, Matt, I, I did want to kind of uh, dive in a little bit because um, I had some, some questions for you and wanted to um, talk to you a little bit about your uh, kind of journey and trying to to uncover the, the clues that you were going through um, that you wrote out in your book and t- tell us a little bit about um, how you kind of went around different parts of the world and talked to different people to, to uncover these stories. Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess I'll give a, I, I think we need to give a brief overview of the Dow first of all, and what happened. Um, so the Dow uh, was a, a pretty simple idea. Uh, when you think about it, it, it was a way for um, the Ethereum community to kind of pool its money and uh, to, to fund development projects that it um, that would go up for a vote to all the DAO members. So it's you can think of it sort of like a decentralized digital venture capital fund. Um, so it was a great idea because everybody, um, you know, back then even, and today, of course, needs money to develop their DAPs um, for whatever they want to do, like decentralized exchanges or um, you know f- yield farming, uh, all the all the things we're seeing today. So. Uh, it was created by Christoph Jens at Slocket, and um, the, the money started pouring in. Uh, at, the, at the end of the day, when the, the crowdfunding period ended, they had $150 million worth of ETH uh, in the DAO. Um, so, like, just uh, <laughs> to put it mildly, Christoph was like freaking out at that point because he thought, you know, maybe five, 10 million at the most would, would be in the DAO. Um, but it, it ended with 150 million. Kind of like I said, that I think a big reason for that is people were excited. They wanted to support it. And there wasn't really much else to do with Ether. Um, a lot of folks, you know, could have gotten in at the crowd sale um, for 30 cents, you know, or, or maybe a dollar. So there was a lot of ETH floating around and it all kind of, a lot of it ended up in the Dow. Um, so the Dow starts chugging along. And um, in June of 2016, uh, on a Friday, I think it was the 17th, uh, it had the, the value of the ETH in the Dow, of course, goes up and down based on the price, and it had gone up to $250 million. So there was a quarter of billion dollars in the Dow. <laughs> um, the, 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 the contract itself was always kind of considered buggy. Uh, Goon, Goon had done a lot of great work uh, in pointing out some of the security flaws. Um, other people like Peter Vicenis had also done that. Um, uh, Christian rights fighter uh, as well. So, uh, you know, I, I think uh, behind the scenes, people were, were a little bit freaking out, but nobody was willing to kind of pull the plug or, or put a moratorium on it um, as Goon called for. So on that Friday, uh, people woke up around the world to see Ether getting drained out of the Dow. Uh, there, there was a bug 
and it was unstoppable because it was in the code. Um, so over the course of that day, about $55 million worth of ether, uh, got stolen. And, um, it, uh, it, it was, I, like I said before, I remember sitting on my couch in Brooklyn. I, I was sick that day. Uh, you know, I read the story and I'm just like, you know, you're watching this theft. It's like, you're watching a bank robbery in progress and there's nothing you can do about it, which was like kind of the first things that fascinated me about it. Um, and then I, I see Goon, uh, as a speaker, are you able to chime in here, Goon? Well, let's see. Does this work now? This is like the umpteenth. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So glad to be here. So nice to chat with you, Matt. And uh, so happy to have uh, such a great group just uh, reminiscing about the old days. Um, yeah, I think Matt set the stage and uh, set us up for the, for the moment of the heist, which we can expand on. But I, I want to spend a little bit of time, Matt, right before right before the heist. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the, the run up to it. So everybody has essentially the same story, at least, uh, sorry, at least my vantage point on the story. So uh, uh, the, my first introduction to the DAO was about three weeks prior to, or three or four weeks prior to the, uh, the hack. And uh, Vlad Zamfir was in Ithaca at the time, and uh, he was visiting my group, we were hanging out, and uh, the goal was generally to, to think about consensus protocols, to think about various different distributed systems topics. And uh, I remember we were having dinner one night and um, uh, there were a group of us, Vlad was sitting right across from me and he said, well, there's this thing called the DAO. Um, it, it looks like it might be big. And uh, you know, they, they might, it might be, you know, it might be bigger than 5 million. Okay, so, so that's sort of uh, what, uh, you know, what was considered big back then. Um, you know, they wanted to raise about three and maybe five would be great. And, but beyond five, we thought, whoa, that's gonna be really big. And, uh, and if it's really, really big and it's buggy, then it poses an existential threat to the fragile uh, Ethereum ecosystem. So, uh, so Vlad was like, hey, you know, we got to take a look at this, this thing and, uh, you know, it might have issues, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so we started looking carefully at, uh, at how the smart contract was structured. And uh, as Matt pointed out, it had issues. And um, uh, so the goal of any such contract is to capture the will of the people, right? It's, you, want, you want to collect the money into this like VC instrument of sorts. And, um, oh, and then there were cool details, right? So this VC instrument can do things that nothing else could do. Uh, and one of the examples, one of the best examples was, hey, you know, what we could do or what one could do is uh, propose that, uh, you know, some amount of money go into building a submarine for, say, ferrying drugs from South America back to the U.S. And this instrument could do it, <laughs> could actually fund it, and no VC could possibly fund it. Obviously, it's a terrible use. But the moment you hear this, you're like, whoa, that can start to happen. And, um, and it's, it's at least interesting, and it has all sorts of ramifications. So we've got to start looking into how this thing is structured, what's happening behind the scenes, and especially if it's going to collect a lot of money in it. So Vlad and I and, uh, and another uh, researcher named Dino Mark started looking into what was happening, I don't know how this code was structured. And we initially found six different issues. And, uh, but time was ticking. So there are these like time frames, like the contract has been launched. So you have 28 days where it collects money. And, uh, and on day 28, it's going to start opening up to the public. It's going to start doing things. And we found six different ways in which this thing could be gained to not capture what the crowds want, to, to do other things, to, to, to get waylaid, to get abused, and, and to use people's money for reasons other than uh, doing things that, uh, that people want to be done with it. So, um, so we ended up, uh, I ended up saying, you know, look, guys, the time is sticking out. We've got, we were on day 24 or 25, I think. And um, we just got to put this out there. And so, uh, you know, I made a makeshift Google Doc document and um, I just opened up to the, to the public because time was running out and there's not a single person who's in a centralized position to put an end to the smart contract. And so uh, the doc document was called a call for a moratorium on the DAO. And, uh, and as soon as I opened it up, um, it got, it hit the, you know, whatever, all the Ethereum folks were, of course, very interested in looking at what was, what might be wrong with it. And so... I don't know how many people have done this, but when you make a, a document public on, on Google Docs, 
And anonymous people are browsing it. They get names like Aardvark, Beaver, Camel, et cetera, A, B, C, D, names like that. And so I had hundreds of people, you know, all these like weird animal names at the very top, looking over our shoulder, even as Dino, Vlad, and I edited that document. And uh, I think over the course of that day, we, we found uh, three more issues with it. So I think there are like a total of nine different issues that we identified. And some of them are really fundamental. And uh, anyhow, so it was against that backdrop you know, there was a, that started the discussion of what to do, uh, whether there, there should be a, a moratorium, whether the, there were these curators, whether the curators should, should uh, nix proposals from being voted on, what should happen. There was a discussion going on. And then on the fateful day, as Matt uh, pointed out, uh, people around the world woke up and uh, messages were going around saying, hey, the DAO is being drained. And we ended up watching uh, a hacker or hackers um, taking a substantial chunk of money out of this thing. It was like a slow-mo, uh, relatively slow-mo bank heist. Yeah, and it's, I, I think the structure of the DAO gets really fascinating here because um, you, you couldn't, you, the, the guy just didn't walk off with the money. He had to, um, the, the way it was working is like, if you wanted to get your money out for whatever reason, you, you, um, you, you did a proposal, uh, you have to wait seven days, and then you, um, it, a child DAO is created. So it's a mini version of the DAO and your funds get put in that child DAO. And um, I think it's, uh, I can't remember the days exactly, but I think it was like 20 some days later, you could get your money out. So even though, so this thief had, had stolen all this money, but it was still sort of in the DAO still. And so everybody could see the child DAO and they knew um, that they had, you know, roughly 30 some days to do something about it. And um, so I, I so th that's another fascinating part of this story. Um, it's it's kind of like, you know, you're the bank robber, but you're you're sitting there waiting for your getaway car and uh, everybody's running around trying to figure out what to do about you. So um, the folks that started to do that were, were, were started with the Slocket folks like Griff Green uh, left Terrace. Um, it was there and they started um first of all trying to figure out who the attacker might be um because uh you, you, to get into one of those child DAOs, you know you, you sort of have to uh, you have to make a proposal and, and you could kind of go to them and and at, they, they started asking these people like who are you <laughs> which is not really polite in a, in a blockchain world where privacy is so um you know uh, important to people. But I think in this circumstance, a lot of folks kind of stepped up and, and Griff said that, you know, people were sending him copies of their driver's licenses. And, and so they were trying as soon as possible to figure out if they, you know, who's the ident identity of these people or person who just ripped us off. Um, that didn't actually end up working, but then they also started, um, getting together and, um, f they formed this group. Uh, it was a, it was a chat group that they named Robin hood um, to see like what they could do um, in the time that they had uh, to, about the hack. And uh, long story short, they, they basically realized that they um, could um, replicate the attack and, and safely quote unquote, drain the rest of the money in the Dow because um, there was 12 million, I think roughly 12 million ether in the Dow. The Dow hacker got 3.4 million in that first hack. And so, you know, there was eight plus million DAO, uh, ETH still left. So they knew that, that the attacker could come back at any time. Um, it was all also now public, like out in the public sphere, how the attack was orchestrated. So there could be copycats. And um, so these guys, Griff Green and, and his, his buddies all um, started figuring out how to replicate the attack. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll let you pick it up from there, Goon, if you want. Oh, it looks like it, it just kind of disconnected again. Oh, um, so we'll get him back on. All right. But yeah, so, but yeah that's, that's, go ahead. So yeah, so it's a fascinating time. And um, one of the fascinating things in writing the book was getting to talk to all these folks that, um, in the Robin Hood group and, and just to, to get a sense of their, um, their, their, they were the, the trepidation. Like they, they were not sure how the community would respond because um, pretty quickly they were able to, um, uh, replicate the attack. Uh, Jordi Bailina was involved at this point. And, um, you know, some, it, it wasn't 
wasn't difficult because they, they had a roadmap, but they didn't know, like, ethically, legally, like, could they do this? Um, how would it be received by the community? So they kind of, um, and then they had some just really funny, uh, like, uh, just sort of like funny mishaps, um, like hijinks ensued. Um, they, they were going to launch, you know, because they had to get into a child DAO to um, perform the attack to save the rest of the ETH. So to get into a child DAO, you know, you, you've got to launch a contract and you've got to be ready. And um, Alex Van de Sand was ready to do that uh, in his apartment in Brazil. And he's about to push the button and his internet failed. <laughs> and so, you know, it's just like funny stuff like that. Um, so they, they weren't able to do that. And then they had some other technical issues that came up and uh, they were just kind of, um, they were ready, but, you know, again, not, not sure that they were willing. Um, one thing they did know though, if, if like the hacker came back or if there was a copycat, they were going to, they were going to do it. And so what happened was the, the first attack was on Friday. There wasn't another big attack until Tuesday, but it did start and it's, it was the same sort of, um, attack. And, uh, so that's when, that's when the Robin Hood group knew they had to get going and, and they, um, they were ready and they launched their own attack and they, they had so many DAO tokens, um, in their control at that point that they, um, just blew out the, uh, the copycat thief and were basically able to drain, um, you know, millions of ETH out of the DAO in, in a matter of hours. Um, and, uh, so that was where, um, uh, and, and I guess I'll just like, one interesting thing when I was writing my book and I did not understand this until, um, you know, doing this research was that there was a, there were many different DAO hacks. There, there wasn't just one. Um, there was obviously the one on Friday. That was the big one. Um, then the one on Tuesday, I, I'm quite certain was a different person. Um, it, it looks very different. Um, the person wasn't very, um, they weren't very careful with how they moved their um, Bitcoin around and their ether around. So, when I was writing my book, uh, I was able to get some help from some forensics folks and um, just looking in the, the blockchain world, um, the, the records on Etherscan. And I, I was able to make a, a couple of leaps because I had a source at an exchange telling me that this, uh, tell me the identity of a person who had withdrawn Bitcoin and then changed it into Ether and, and DAO tokens and then used that to fund the, the attack on Tuesday. Um, the other fun thing I had was uh, an encrypted message that um, this hacker sent to the Robinhood group and somebody shared that with me. And they had, they had unencrypted it and it was, it was basically, um, you know, kind of taunt, taunting them and saying, hey, you know, don't don't steal all this ether. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give mine back if you give yours back. And so it, it was kind of funny. Um, it, but was, uh, so, but I knew the address that it came from was, you know, like a bad guy address. And I was able to link that, um, transfer out, um, from an, an exchange to that address. So, um, and it was only about four hops, uh, along the blockchain into different addresses, um, before I was able to do that. So now, uh, I had, I had the identity, I, th I thought, of someone who was involved with um, the, the attack on Tuesday. Yeah, that's, that's amazing how uh, there was always um, these kind of uh, other co copycat capabilities that were coming into this space. Um, we actually uh, have Goon here. Uh, he's on uh, Kevin's account, so he'll, he'll be able to chime in and um, participate now in this conversation. But thanks, Matt, for, for walking us through that. And uh, it's, it's really uh, crazy how much you went through to kind of uncover all this uh, for your book. So um, one, one quick uh, thing, we'll, we'll I, let... I thought I, I always think it's kind of fun to see what the Dow uh, hack and, and what it would be in today's prices. So as of today, if the Dow when it had not been hacked and it had that 12 million, ETH, it, it would be worth twenty two point eight billion dollars today. And the Dow, the original Dow thief on Friday would have gotten away with six point five billion dollars worth of Ether. Well, wow, yeah, that's incredible to kind of to, to hear about it in today's values, because, um, yeah, if that would happen today, it would be a much, much bigger story. And, you know, it's definitely an impactful moment kind of in, in crypto history. And, um, you know, I, I'd like to kind of dive into like what that means going forward. You know, what what has what has kind of come from that in, in terms of the idealism of decentralization and the decisions that the Ethereum community had to kind of 
face at the time and would love to kind of hear your thoughts on um, how, how they kind of had to come together as a community to solve this issue and what that meant for, for smart contracts and, and the community going forward. So uh, I can jump in. I have been turned into a Greek statue. So uh, I apologize for this. Great, thanks. (laughs) So uh, I ended up having to borrow Kevin uh, Sekniki's phone, and uh, he's here telling me about the superiority of iPhones over Androids because my Android is uh, clearly having issues. Um, But uh, uh, I think the question is is, is exactly as as you posed, uh, which is what do we do to... uh, to, uh, to make sure that the, uh, the DAP infrastructure of the future is, uh, that, that's being built, uh, that was being built at the time, um, is, uh, is secure. And uh, in a hurry, like life comes at you very fast when you have one of these bug moments. And um, I think prior to that, as an academic, we always talked about the importance of formal verification, about formal reasoning. And, uh, and suddenly, you know, everybody realized that, hey, we need to make sure that contracts are audited. We need to make sure that contracts do what they do um, or do what they say they do and uh, what people expect them to do. So there's, there are two different issues there. One of them is, is specifying in cl- clear English what exactly they should expect and then specifying it formally and then checking that formally. There can be errors on, on every, at every step of the way there. And uh, I'm proud to say that post the DAO, um, I think the, the entirety of the Ethereum community has been attuned very, very strongly to, uh, to, uh, to, towards formal verification. I, I spent a lot of time myself going uh, around uh, to my colleagues in formal verification, getting them interested, talking to them about the significance of this domain and about the different techniques that it demands. And uh, I can expand on that a little bit, actually, now that there is a, an audience here of a uh, of fair, fair number of... Um, of uh, technical people. So uh, uh, the, uh, the kinds of things that the DAO requires uh, for formal verification are actually somewhat different than what people are used to, to checking or verifying with formal verification. So that's an area that's been around for 30 years. And uh, it's an area that has been focusing mostly on safety. So checking to make sure that uh, that invariants that should never be violated are never violated on any path in the code. For example, you know, the DAO should never mint tokens, right? Or the DAO should never give tokens uh, to somebody who's undeserving, et cetera, et cetera. On every path, uh, nothing bad must happen. And they have various techniques that are fairly efficient for checking this. Now, there's a second category of uh, properties that the the verification community knows how to check, and that has to do with uh, liveness. And that is, on every path, something something good eventually happens. And uh, the techniques for checking liveness are not as good, uh, are not as as, uh, widely researched, but nevertheless, they exist. But when you come to to something like the DAO, you actually end up needing entirely different techniques because the properties that you need to check are no longer what we call path properties. That is, you can't check them in isolation on a path. You can check a single execution path for safety to make sure that something is not violated. You can check a single path in isolation to make sure it ends up in something good. You end up in a good state. These are very important in distributed systems. But for something like the DAO, you actually need to check game theoretic properties. You need the DAO to be incentive compatible. You need the DAO to have, you know, things like regret freedom. For example, that is to say, if my preference is for the DAO to fund A over B, and you happen to like uh, funding B over C, and somebody else has different properties, C over A, et cetera, then our votes should capture something that's good for the entirety of the universe. Now, these require reasoning about people's preferences. They require uh, reasoning about things that would have happened on different code paths had you done different things. Now, if you imagine what you need to check behind the scenes, it's exponentially more of the state space that you need to navigate. So uh, my colleagues in program verification are nowhere near equipped to check for these automatically. That's why that paper by by myself and uh, Vlad Zampier and and, uh, Dino Mark uh, it, it's actually an interesting analysis. It's a game theoretic analysis of the DAO, 
And we need tools for doing this. I've been going around for, ever since the Dow happened, I've been going around telling people of the importance of research in this area. And, uh, and I've been trying to get people to bite. And uh, hopefully we'll see research in this area. It's badly needed. And uh, I think we're grateful to the Dow for driving home the point that this is actually a very important and new area of research. Yeah, and I, I think it should be pointed out um, they did have a security audit. It was done. Um, they didn't find this problem. And that whoever the attacker was on that, that original attack is really very sophisticated and, and very impressive. Um, they, they found a, a back door that nobody had found um, before, prior and people gotten close. Like uh, maybe now Goon is the time to tell the story about um, you and Phil trading emails uh, the Monday before the attack. Uh, I think it's pretty widely known, but um, you you guys did actually put your finger on it, but you didn't think it was you didn't think it was something that could be exploited. Is that am I saying that correctly? That's right. That's right. We came so close. We came so close, and I got criticized so heavily for it too. Um, so uh, yeah, so that Monday, um, right before the hack, I was I was actually in bed, and I was I, oh, I was I was so sick. I, it was it was June, I think, and it was like one of those summer colds. Nobody ever wants to get a cold in the summer. I had a cold in the summer. I was miserable. My eyes are tearing. My, my face is congested. I just kind of wanted to die in the bed right there. And, uh, and I remember very distinctly that I was looking at the code and I was like, hey, it looks like this code makes a, makes a payment, then makes a state change. So that's kind of dangerous because when you make a payment, you jump to the, the to, to code that is uh, provided by the recipient. And uh, so you lose control of what you were doing. And then you come back and you make the state change. So that's, that's ripe for a re-entrancy bug. That's, uh, that's kind of dangerous. So um, I wrote to, um, to uh, Phil Diane and I said, hey, Phil, on line 666, there seems to be a problem. And... Uh, and it was, uh, it was really interesting. So, um, and then, you know, that's sort of like what, what a professor does, right? You kind of sort of find new exciting things and then you give them to the, the smartest person you know who's an expert in that area and uh, usually a, a younger uh, graduate student and uh, see what they do with it. And uh, Phil uh, immediately looked at it and uh, came back to me and he hadn't even started at Cornell then. He was... Uh, he was on, in transition. He had just graduated from university, but he wasn't really a gra graduate student yet. But nevertheless, very, very bright uh, person, the brightest, obviously, and the one in command of this area, the best. And I said, hey, you know, take a look. And uh, he came back and said, yeah, you know, there might be an issue there, but uh, it's, uh, it's not possible to, uh, uh, to exercise it. And uh, so I looked at it again, and, uh, you know, it's on, uh, it's on Phil and me that uh, we kind of went back and forth and we incorrectly convinced ourselves that, that uh, the bug could not be exercised. <laughs> and we thought, okay, well, that was a hypothesis. And uh, we discarded it incorrectly. And uh, I blamed the summer cold. And, uh, and, uh, and so we just kind of sat on it and, and it slipped by. Had we, had we uh, noticed that it, could, it was drainable, we would, of course, have let people know. And uh, so, yeah, that's what happened on the Monday before. Yeah, the way the way I like to think about explaining the hack in, in an analogy is you've got 10 bank tellers and you're going to withdraw your money. You've got $100 in your account and you go to the first bank teller and you say, yes, I'd like my $100, please. And they're about to hand it to you and you say, no, wait. And then you go to the second teller and you say, I'd like my $100, please. They're about to give it to you. You say, wait. You, so you go all down the line um, and instead of getting a um, hundred dollars that you have in your account at the end of the day, you get a thousand dollars. So um, it, it, that, that in a sense is what the, the, the bug was. It was, you could just um, go back and back and back into the Dow, uh, even though, you know, you didn't have, you, you of course didn't have as much um, as you were taking out. Um, and uh, so one thing that is also uh, w when I was looking at the code um, that the, the different attack contracts used, um, it was very interesting that um, the code on the Friday attack was clean. It looked really nice. Uh, then, and then you look at the attack contract on the Tuesday hack and it's just, it's like, I didn't really know this, to be honest. Uh, I'm not to take credit, but I showed it to some, some, some devs and, and they were like, oh, this is, this code is ugly. It has, you know, line breaks and, and it's like still got those little arrows in it. And so 
uh, I thought that was kind of cool. And, and one of the reasons I think that the, t- the Tuesday attack was a, was a copycat. Yeah, I remember uh, when the attack was taking place. Um, there was a Skype group, group formed, and, um, and I need to tell the story because sometimes people say, oh, Ethereum is centralized and so on and so forth. Well, um, and you know, at the time there was the, the phrase King Vitalik. So, uh, you know, Ethereum is the centralized thing and Vitalik dictates everything that happens on it, etc. And just to dispel that myth, I have to tell everyone what happened as the hack was happening. Vitalik was in that room, of course, and we're like, well, what's happening? We're trying to figure out. Um, and, uh, and there is no analysis yet, right? So you're just seeing the funds get drained and uh, clearly not that many tokens are being cashed in at that moment. There's clearly something happening. And uh, Vitalik started spamming the network to slow down the hacker. So he did not get on the phone with the, uh, the miners. He did not. He was not in a position to dictate anything at all. This is the farthest thing from the king of a system you could imagine. Had he had centralized control, believe you me, he would have exercised it. And there he is. The only thing he can do is spam the system to slow it down. So um, if anyone says, oh, this is like centralized, this and that, they, are, they have no idea what those words mean. And uh, so, you know, that's just uh, obvious empirical evidence that this thing is, is uncontrollable and as decentralized as it gets. Yeah, and I think, I think that's a good time to talk about the hard fork and, and what um, people, you know, were thinking of in the broader community. Um, so there, there was kind of like two tracks. There was the Robin Hood group and they had um, basically uh, within a couple of days, you know, secured the rest of the DAO tokens uh or yeah or the rest of the eth um so at that point it was like you know um i think it was about 30 the the attacker had gotten about 30 percent so you know uh there's 30 percent in the attacker's contracts and then 70 percent in the robin hood group's account so uh, but what to do about the larger issue of the dow um now you know was it was immediately up for discussion there was couple of options one was a soft fork where you would blacklist addresses but it was quickly pointed out um i believe by phil diane that that would have um issues with other DAOs um and and general smart contract functioning so that was stopped um and then the idea of a hard fork uh pretty much became the the answer matt 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 can i can i can i barge in there because yeah of course that that wasn't how that went, and it was kind of kind of cool how it went. Actually, it's, I'm I'm really proud of what happened behind the scenes there, uh, as well. So uh, so there were two two approaches, just like Matt said. One of them is a soft fork, where the miners examine every transaction, and if they see somebody interacting with the DAO, they toss that transaction out. Sounds like a really really simple way to approach the problem. Soft fork, no changes necessary. We just have to coordinate the miners. Can be done. And uh, everybody had signed off on it. So, you know, you name it, you know, Gav Wood, Vitalik, etc. Everybody had thought about the software proposal and they were like, yes, this is something we could do. And then the next thing to follow on after that was let's so first let's do the soft fork to buy time. And then later on, we can do the hard fork and uh, and the hard fork requires some community discussion. Uh, but, uh, you know, whatever. So, you know, we're going to do that in the, in, the, in the background. And then the hard fork can be rolled out if, if the community decides it's a good idea. And uh, time was, again, ticking towards, uh, towards the, uh, the soft fork deadline. And what happened then was I received an, an email from someone who had last sent me an email maybe um, seven months prior. It turned out to be a high school student. And uh, his name was Jaden Hess. And Jaden said, hey, professor, you may, you may remember me, you may not, but I'm this high school student from New York. And, uh, you know, I wrote to you, uh, you know, whatever, seven months ago to, when I was applying to Cornell. You know, I got into Cornell and, uh, you know, I've been taking a look at Ethereum, very excited about this process, et cetera, et cetera. And he says, look, everybody is considering the soft fork proposal, but doesn't this soft fork open up a giant security hole? And then he described the security hold, which is fairly easy, which is if you have a smart contract platform and the miners are tasked with examining these transactions, and if they toss the transaction out with it, without including it in the blockchain, uh, they end up not collecting gas from those transactions. So um, then what an attacker could do 
is they could flood the network with transactions that touch the DAO. And those transactions would then consume cycles on every miner, but they would not be able to be included on the blockchain. So they would come at a zero cost to the attacker. So the attacker could consume the, the, the life of, of all miners out there by just flooding the network with transactions that take a long time. And at the very end, they touch the DAO. And the miners don't know this until they get to the very end of the execution. So, um, so I thought, whoa, you know, I don't know how we missed this, but every one of us missed this. Let's write this up. So uh, Jaden, uh, a high school student, and uh, to this date, the youngest person with whom I wrote a paper, I wrote a blog post, Jaden, uh, one of his friends, uh, uh, River, and uh, myself, uh, wrote a paper that says soft fork is uh, considered harmful. It's not a good idea. It's going to open up a, another attack vector. And uh, uh, it's actually, a, it points to a strength of smart contract platforms, which is that uh, it's harder to censor them because of this particular attack. If you start censoring uh, on, a, on a smart contract platform, you end up uh, becoming liable to attacks. Anyhow, uh, we posted that blog post. Um, it was a surprise to many people and uh, it cost another like I think uh, Ethereum price went down another 10% I felt really bad it was about a billion dollars at the time in, in market cap so I call it the hundred million dollar blog post uh, by a high schooler by the way first author is a high schooler and um, you know I, I think uh, weeks after the event I wrote to Vitalik said hey or I actually spoke to Vitalik and I said hey you know sorry about this we felt bad and uh, to his credit, he was like, no, no, that's not a $100 million loss. It's a $900 million preservation. And uh, he thanked us for it. And uh, anyway, so that was kind of a fun, uh, fun little episode of how the soft fork idea got discarded. And then came the hard fork discussion. Okay, thanks for the clarification. So that must have happened really quickly, right? Because there, the, um, the, the GitHub repo shows that, you know, that the original um, proposal was pulled like within a day, I think, was that, is that how you recall? Um, yeah, I think so. It was very, very quick. So, well, yeah. the proposal idea was in the air at first and then uh, it got formalized. And then by that time we had also written up the blog post and, and then it got pulled out because it would have been a, a problem. Yeah. And as you mentioned, the, the hard fork idea needs consensus because you're basically asking everyone in the network to upgrade their software to include the fork. So, I think there's a common misperception that, you know, Ethereum just like did this uh, hard fork willy nilly when in fact, you know, it was everyone on the on the network, the miners and everybody running nodes that were, you know, necessary to make that change. Um, and there was there was definitely uh, there was definitely, you know, uh, Vitalik was out there talking to people, trying to convince people that this was the right thing to do. Other people were doing the same. But um, I think. Uh, at, at the end of the day, you know, it, it always comes down to a vote. And I do think that that, that shows the decentralized nature of, of um, you know, these, these systems. Do, what do you think, Goon? Yeah, um, I mean, there was a lot of discussion around the hard fork idea. It's not something to be taken lightly. And I remember uh, what, at around that time, there was this, this uh, boot camp uh, in Ithaca at Cornell. And uh, uh, a lot of the thought leaders in Ethereum were there. So Vitalik was there in person. Uh, Vlad was there in person, Alex van der Sand was there in person, uh, Martin Beze was there, so there are many others as well. And so I remember all of us around the table and, uh, you know, standing up in between, like this was like during a lunch break or something. And, and I said, guys, you know, look, I'm not going to judge. Um, I have a simple question and uh, it, it's about this hard fork thing, which is, what do you see as the vision for this thing? Is, is this DAP thing that you keep talking about, is that where you want to go? Or do you want to attract the kind of like, you know, the, the, the black market money flows, etc., cetera, that, um, uh, that one sees uh, on, on blockchains? So if you want the system to be used for, you know, whatever else, like the, the, all sorts of things that are illicit, et cetera, then you clearly can never do uh, a hard fork of any kind and uh, you know whatever bugs you've got that's what you got but if you really are, are believers in this dap vision then and you are believers in this you know this like new universe where there's going to be a switch to proof of stake and uh 
you know, et cetera, et cetera. You're going to have uh, coin voting on, the, like the consensus protocol will depend on, on, on coins. Well, then you can't just have 15% of your coin supply in the hands of an attacker like this. And, um, and, uh, and, and, you know, that's sort of the, the second thing. So what, which one is it and, or, or, you know, which one of the two are you guys veering towards? And it's okay to be like, you know, whatever. I just, no judgment here. Just, let's just be honest. And I remember everybody immediately saying it's very clearly the DAP vision. And, uh, and uh, it's very clearly that, uh, that uh, they, wanted, they wanted proof of stake. And, um, and so I think that kind of was, for me, the moment that sealed what was going to happen in the future. It was very clear that, that Ethereum had very legitimate intentions. It was very clear that, uh, that, uh, that what was about to happen, you know, what, what, what needed to happen was undoing of the, the attack. And uh, I, mean, I have my many other thoughts. So we all kind of started giving a lot of thought to why a hard fork? Why change the blockchain? And then there was a huge discussion on is code law or, you know, what is, what, what is law or what should happen here? What should ethically happen here? And it's not an easy question, um, but I know how I felt at the time. And, uh, and I know the discussions a little bit, but there was a, there was a lot of discussion around, uh, around how to remedy the situation. Yeah, and I think it's, it's a, another interesting point on that is that the hard fork only did one thing. It went back and changed the code in the DAO itself. It didn't affect any other transaction that had happened in the days since the attack to the, to the day when the hard fork was implemented. It, it simply went back and changed the code of that smart contract so that it now uh, basically was changed to, if you have DAO tokens, you can send them to this contract and you will get your ether back. And that, that's what was approved um, in the vote. Um, there was one mining pool in China called F2, F2 pool that did not vote to, um, for the upgrade or, or they kept on the old chain. And that's, um, that's the reason we have Ethereum Classic today. Um, not only did they not vote, on the uh, to, for the upgrade or, or upgrade their software, they continued mining on the old chain, which is really um, you know uneconomical and and uh, like it's it's difficult at first uh, to do that. So um, you know it's led a lot of people to believe that it was coordinated and um, the existence of Ether Classic was something that um, you know definitely not many people um, expected or, or or even thought of, but it, it happened and. Um, I know, Goon, you, you guys were uh, getting some interesting emails uh, around that time for people who now wanted to buy your ETH Classic, right? Absolutely. Yeah, we were sitting around uh, again, uh, you know, I think a few days later or a day later or something. And, uh, and uh, the hard fork had happened. Um, and uh, a lot of people had criticized the hard fork decision. Um, I, was, I was pro hard fork. Let me uh, be very clear. But I did not participate in any of the discussions. I, I was like, okay, I think every community needs to do this independently. And, um, and I don't, well, whatever, for, for whatever reasons, I decided, okay, let me step out of this one. And, um, and so, but deep down, I felt the following, and I didn't want to say it publicly at the time, but enough time has passed, so I'll say it. So I think things can be reverted if there is a system bug. If the system is supposed to do X and it doesn't, then, you know, you can take that back. In the same way that Bitcoin is supposed to mint 21 million coins, there's an underflow bug. Somebody mints like whatever it is, 64 billion or however many Bitcoins they minted. Then you can take that back. Everybody understands that. That is non-controversial. So, uh, and everybody will admit this. All of the Bitcoiners will say this. All the, even the most extreme maxis will have to say this because after all, they did it on their chain a few times. So, um, uh, so this bug is, is a little special and kind of different, right? The bug is in the in user code. And uh, so it's not, you can't just say this is a system bug. It's not, it's not on the side of the code where, you know, system developers uh, wrote uh, itself, but it's, it's in code that the user wrote on top. So, um, but deep down, I felt the following, and I couldn't say it at the time because of legal ramifications it would have. Deep down, the bug was in user code because the system developers failed to communicate clearly to the user code writers, to the DAP developers, what the DAP developers needed to do. So many people had audited that code and so many people had missed this. 
that it was clear that the Ethereum community did not fully understand the EVM, and the Ethereum community did not, at the time, fully understand how to write correct code, given the, the, uh, the Solidity's uh, uh, semantics. So, uh, so that's, that's what really it came down to. I, for me, it was, okay, it's not a system bug per se, but it's a system, it's a, it's a bug stemming from the system side. It's a failure to communicate the API clearly. And so it is, in my worldview at least, uh, still entirely a, um, a, uh, a system, system initiated issue. And the, ex the, the events that happened are out of expectation with almost every single user of the system except the hacker. So, uh, so I thought this is, uh, uh, this, at the time I thought this is uh, exactly the, the reasons for why you can do a hard fork. And then the hard fork was about to happen. And so, of course, all the voices, you know, there was a crescendo of craziness, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, uh, and uh, right before, you know, right before the, the, the fork itself, um, we were sitting around the table and, uh, and uh, emails started to come in uh, from notable figures we recognize in the space saying, hey, I want to buy your coins on the old chain. And uh, these are not, not friendly messages. I, you know, I don't think that that person really wanted to, to buy any coins. I, thought, I think that what they really wanted to do was, I want to signal to you that I will be forking and, uh, and living on the old fork of your old system. And that's a very hostile thing to do and uh, kind of a silly thing to do. And uh, you know, back then, it was a very geeky, very, very odd space. Uh, still kind of is, but it was even worse back then. And uh, anyway, so there was messaging of this kind. We laughed at it. We thought, okay. And then we also thought, okay, that's not a friendly thing to do at all. That's only a jerk would write something like that. And, um, and anyhow, and then after the fork, of course, there was, there was that split in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in between Ethereum Classic and Ethereum itself. Yeah. And, um... And there's there's more about that episode in the book if you're interested. Uh, and, and names are named. I'm not going to do that here. Uh, and and the people we're talking about have a chance to to give their side of the story. Um, so moving forward, I think there was obviously for a year or, or two at least there was quite a bit of trepidation about setting up another DAO. Um, but I've been really uh, encouraged to see that it, that you know it only lasted a, a little while. Um, Aaron Wright has, has been great on that with um, his Lao project. Um, there's Flamingo Dow, there's Seed Club, there's um, there's this one I was just seeing the other day, um, Vida Dow, which is um, looking to create a Dow to invest in uh, human longevity science. So if any of you guys know Vitalik, he, he wants to live forever. Um, he's he's given a he's done an AMA for that one. Um, uh, there's friends with benefits and social tokens, which are, are really cool and fascinating. And um, so I think one of the things that uh, has always impressed me with Ethereum is that um, there are setbacks and there are price crashes and there's, there's, you know, this, that, and the other, there's always fighting between Bitcoin people and Ethereum people, but there's a huge community that just keeps building stuff and keeps putting products out and, and keeps trying to um, push the boundaries of what this stuff can do. And so I think we're seeing a new era of DAOs um, where a lot of lessons have been learned. Uh, but, you know, and I think I think the DAO itself in 2016, like like you said, Goon, was was instrumental in in um, teaching people that, you know, especially when you're dealing with other people's money, you have to be very careful. And, you know, there should probably be limits on what you can do and raise and all these things. But I think um, after that initial sort of um, terrifying experience uh, that that really almost you know that could have been the end of Ethereum. I think people were actually you know it was dicey there for a while, uh, but you know it's been worked through and here we are you know five years later and um, there's all these new different DAOs that that are, are are up and running and and so far doing a pretty good job. Yeah, can you imagine yeah. how the world would have been if? Uh... If the if the DAO had, had if the if there hadn't been a hard fork, we would still be sitting here and we'd be monitoring the the attackers move and uh, you know it's like he he like he forked off into another child DAO and so forth and people would have their coins all trapped in there and so forth. It would have been a ginormous mess, and uh, 
and uh, it was very clear that it would be put behind and and, and just become a historical event, and uh, uh, and it did. It's uh, you know I think Ethereum must thrive, and uh, and as you rightfully point out, there's so much more to do on the DAO's on on DAO side, and uh, I'm also happy to see a lot of experimentation happening on Avalanche as well, um, and. Uh, uh, you know, there's in, in decision theory, uh, there is a lot of interesting, interesting ways of capturing the will of the people. And Avalanche, with its appeal to sort of humans and communities, with its uh, people-centric design, I think is a great place to, uh, to experiment with, and also cheap fees, it's a great place to experiment with, uh, with, uh, with these kinds of uh, innovation. Yeah. Um, sorry, sorry to uh, cut in here as we ran up against the hour, and, and that's a great uh, kind of point to end off on. And, and Matt, thank you for sharing uh, how you feel about how this has affected the future and how all of these DAOs are getting built now. And um, just want to kind of wrap it up and, and really thank you both for, for joining us. Thanks, Goon, for working through these technical difficulties and jumping on. And really uh, big thanks to Matt um, for, for joining us and coming on and sharing your knowledge. If you'd like to go check out his book, it's called Out of the Ether. It's a really great read about this, uh, this impactful moment in the history of, of, of cryptocurrency. And we wanted to thank everybody else for joining and listening in with us. It's been a really great conversation. And uh, if you want to you know, follow us and hear more, we're at Avalanche AVAX on Twitter and follow us across different social channels. Um, Matt, thanks so much for joining yeah, us. Yeah, you're welcome. It was, it was really fun. Thanks for, for, thanks for doing this. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank thanks, thanks, thanks to everyone who joined. It was great to chat about the old days. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll talk to everyone soon. Thanks.